train rattling in gentle unison with his thoughts as it slid over the surface of the cold, flat, boxing day bungalow land of this portion of the coast, began to slow down and then stopped at the first stop, Heatcham. There was a gloomy pause, then the handle of his door was rudely and ruthlessly seized and a cold woman seeming to bring with her all the pain and bleakness of the Norfolk winter outside violated his centrally heated fault closet. She was apparently of the servant class and as soon as she had entered she lowered the window and began talking volubly to a friend on the platform who had come to see her off. This woman on the platform wore no hat, he noticed, in spite of the cold. But instead of that, she wore a hairnet over her hair. He looked at this hairnet with dull misery in his heart. Even after the train had started and the woman had vanished, he retained a picture of that hairnet and wondered why it made him miserable, why he hated the woman for wearing it, why he obscurely felt that she had been giving him cause for resentment. Net. Netty, it dawned on him. Of course, that was it. Net, which equaled Netta. He had been quite right. The woman had been hurting him. She had been trying all the time as she talked to her friend to remind him of Netta. Uh, here we are at the uh, Royal Victoria Hotel in Hastings, St. Leonard's. And it's one of these kind of uh, seaside uh, uh, rooming houses, guest houses, where an early Patrick Hamilton would have stayed as a lad. And uh, you see very much in his, uh, in his book, Slaves of Solitude and uh, the early trilogy, uh, The Midnight Bell, um, his uh, rooming house experience where he grew up with uh, his family who uh, his father had aspirations to be a novelist as well but he was uh, by all accounts a terrible writer but he did stumble across an inheritance uh, which he kind of largely squandered um, but the family um, did move from place to place in Sussex and uh, here we are in East Sussex uh, or Sussex Hastings uh, the kind of uh, decadent seaside um, environment that a young Patrick Hamilton would have uh, felt comfortable in before he moved to London and found his fame with uh, with with the theatre. And it, it wasn't. Um, I know the first uh, the first novels were highly uh, competent and acclaimed at the time. Uh, the midnight the midnight bell, the uh, the siege of pleasure. Uh, which was later um, compiled under 20,000 Streets Under the Sky. Um, these, these books were, were very, very competent, especially for a man so young, in his early 20s. I mean, it's incredible. It's almost like uh, reading uh, um, um, uh, Fitzgerald, you know, the, the um, kind of God-given ability uh, some young writers have. And uh, Patrick uh, Hamilton was certainly one of these. But it, it was with his uh, theatre work, with Rope and Gaslight, where he actually became uh, better well-known, but also quite rich. Uh, he made um, uh, quite a sum in those days from the theatre. Um, but the book um, I'm, I'm going to concentrate on and read a bit from is um, Hangover Square, um, written in 1939 in the eve uh, just before World War II broke out. It's the story of um, George Harvey Bone, an alcoholic uh, man obsessed with uh, Netta, who is a um, uh, kind of Hollywood, uh, uh, a woman with Hollywood aspirations, and uh, she brings with her these, uh, this kind of glamorous uh, lifestyle um, that George uh, um, aspires to um, in Earl's Court, which uh, is uh, um, at the time a kind of sleazy pub area, now very um, uh, 
upper class place to live, but at the time it was quite decadent. And uh, uh, Patrick was a lover of pubs. I don't think any writer has been able to um, describe or illustrate um, the inside of a British seaside or London tavern with quite such um, uncanny um, attention to detail as Patrick Hamilton did. So, I mean, Hamilton's quite overlooked um, by, um, maybe not by the critics so much, but uh, by, by the public. I mean, he's not, he, he hasn't aged particularly well, um, but I think was just as gifted and as competent a writer as any other um, 20th century novelist um, writing about London at the time. He has a very good turn of phrase excellent, excellent use of the English language and really does describe what it feels to be, um, how it feels to be in love in an, an impossible relationship. Oh dear, these horrible offhand strangers who knew nothing of Netta who would care nothing about Netta, even if they did, but who yet had the power to remind him of Netta and obscurely torture him by wearing hair nets. Oh, Netta, Nets, Netta, a perfectly commonplace name. In fact, if it did not happen to belong to her, and if it did not happen to adore her, a dull, if not rather stupid and revolting name, entirely unromantic, spinterish, mean, like Ethel or Minnie, but because it was hers, look what had gone and happened to it. He could not utter it, whisper it, think of it without intoxication, without dizziness, without anguish. It was incredibly, inconceivably lovely, as incredibly and con inconceivably lovely as Netta herself. It was unthinkable that she could have been called anything else. It was loaded, overloaded with voluptuous yet subtle intimidations of her personality. Netta, the tangled net of her hair, the dark net, the brunette, the net in which he was caught, nettled, nettles, the wicked poison nettles from which he had been brewed, the portion which was his in his blood, stinging nettles. She stung and wounded him with words from her red mouth, nets, fishing nets, mermaids nets, bewitchment nets, sirens, the unearthly beauty of the sea, nets, nest, to nestle, to nestle against her red Breast, breast in her net. Netta, you could go on like that forever, all the way back to London. The, the, uh, the protagonist um, on a train ride back to London where he's going to see um, his uh, beloved uh, Netta. The whirls and track clicked out the familiar and unmistakable rhythm. The sly, gentle, suggestive rhythm, unlike any of its others, of a train entering a major London terminus. And he was filled with unease and forebodings, as he always was by this sound. Thought and warmth must give place to action in cold streets. Reality, buses, tubes, booking office, life again, electric lit London, endless terrors. Oh dear, here we were. Here was the platform under the huge roof hollow, hellish, echoing noises, as in a swimming bath and the porters lined up for the attack. No getting out of it now. Foreboding gave place almost to panic Liverpool Street Station. Where was he going? What was his plan of campaign? He realised he had made none. He was going along to Netta's, of course, but would she be there? She had said she would, but only in an offhand way. She never said she'd be anywhere save in an offhand way. Boxing night, of course she wouldn't be there. She would go out somewhere on boxing night. Peter would take her out. She'd be out dancing while people danced on boxing night. Out with Peter doing God knows what. What was he to do if he found she was gone? This was terrible. He must get over there at once and find out the worst.